Hi, my name is Noah Gift, and today we're going to talk about ML Ops from really zero all the way to the point where you get into ML Ops platforms, train models both on Databricks, also train those models on uh, a traditional platform like Scikit-Learn uh, and containerize it, and then push those models into production using services like AWS AppRunner. So really a very platform-centric approach, as well as uh, a way to interact with tools like ML Flow and ML Run, as well as Scikit-Learn, uh, Fast API, and AWS AppRunner. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I think a good place to start would be to check out one of one of my projects and and we can kind of build that out and, and go from there. So give this a second. This should just, this should load up in just a second. Okay, so we're back in the this environment. Let me just talk you through what this environment does real quick. A few things to point out about these cloud-based development environments is that they're constantly being evolved. And so they're, it's almost like a subscription service to, to like Netflix or Apple TV or something like that where you just constantly get new content. But in this case, you're constantly getting new features. In this case, you can do a lot of things with AWS. If you go to the tab on the left here, notice that I can look at like API gateways. I can look at App Runner, which is something we'll do later. We can look at CloudFormation, ECR, which is the Container Registry, ECS, which is the um, the Amazon's uh, containers solution. Uh, also IoT, Lambda. It's just constantly getting improved here, which is really nice for developing things really quickly. Uh, I'm going to start though showing you this section, which is the file system. And the file system is where I'm going to check out a project and kind of build this thing from scratch. So to, to start with, uh, I'm going to have to build out a, a structure inside of my environment. So in order to do that, uh, what I'll need to do is uh, check out a project I've got recently. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and find that project real quick, which is going to be um, continuous integration. So I'm going to clone a repo here. So I'm going to say git clone. And uh, in this case, actually, I, I don't want to clone the HTTPS URL. I want to actually clone SSH. So I'm going to change that. So let's go ahead and do this. So I'll say git clone. There we go. Now, notice this won't work. Uh oh, we need to set up SSH keys. So the first time you use any new environment, that's just kind of the cost of doing business. You have to you have to go ahead and, and, and set up uh, new keys. I'll just create these new keys real quick by doing SSH keygen dash TR say, okay, got this. And I just need to copy this and I'll paste this into GitHub. So I, I usually just use the cat command, paste this out. This will take just a second. In another window, I'll put my GitHub keys in and then, and then this will work. Okay, keys. Okay, once I've got that set up, then I can rerun that command, which should work now. Go ahead and do that. Get clone, perfect. So, so we got this project set up. So what, what are the key components of kind of basic continuous integration? Well, first, uh, as I mentioned, is a make file. I think this is always a good idea is to have a make file set up. And the, the reason why I like to use make files is that they're a way of, of really enumerating the steps that are necessary for a project. And once you've got these step, steps set up, it's easy to then 
automate things or tell other people how to use your project. That, that's really the, the, the kind of the, the key takeaway. So you can see here there's an install step. This will install software that would be in this requirements file. In this case, I have them versions so that I don't have to worry about there being uh, future updates that make my project not work. Uh, and then the other thing that I do is I test. So I have the ability to test my code. Here's a good example of a uh, library where I say hello, add, just a very simple add number uh, here. And then uh, I also go to the next step, which is linting uh, or form. Oh, let's go to formatting. So formatting would clean up my, my code in case I, I don't know, cut and pasted a snippet and it had spaces instead of tabs or, or, or some issue like that, or tabs versus spaces, whatever you're using, it would clean it up. And then I have a linting step here, which I disable the some two of the annoying uh, warnings, but I just look for the ma the regular warnings and also um, errors. So if the code is not executable, and what this does is it creates a reasonable structure of quality for you know microservices, command line tools, other things that I'm building. So for me, what I typically do if I'm going to run this process is I would create a Python virtual environment. The way I do this is I say Python 3-M VENV, and I, and I like to put the virtual environment in a hidden home directory so it's not accidentally checked in and I don't have to worry about it. So I, so I do this command. Almost all projects, I either put .venv or I will name it the name of the repo. There we go. I've got my Python virtual environment. What I like to do is edit my bash RC file so that I don't have to worry about um, you know sourcing the virtual environment ever again. And if I have a one-to-one -one mapping, uh, typically that works out reasonably well is, is I have you know just one project that I work on, then I can actually source this inside of my shell that I launch every time uh, I work on this project. So in order to do that, I would go into Vim here and go to bash RC. And then at the very bottom of the file, I would go ahead and put a, um, you know, source bash, uh, source virtual env, virtual env like this. And then at this point, I would say source tilde v env bin activate. There we go. And now if I just close this window and I open up a new terminal, we say uh, you do this one plus new terminal. It says, uh oh, this is not available because let's see here source tilde dot v e v bin oh I, I i misspelled it <laughs> that, that that's what i get for for not using tab i, I typically will will use tab to be as a, as a kind of a spell check so all i have to do is just edit this again take this line out and then put this line in there we go activate so it's good it's good to chest to test your changes to make sure you're not blowing things up. There we go. So we've sourced it. How do I know? I just say which Python, right? And we and we know that that's the Python that's in the virtual environment. At this point, things are easy because I have the make file to get things working. All I need to do is I need to CD into this repo and I just type in make all. So all projects I work on, I have this concept. I just run make all. It, it, it does all the steps necessary. There we go. First, I do the installation. Next, after the installation is done, we can do a test. Perfect, uh, and everything works. And then if you wanna go through and, and look at you know running a piece of code, that's it. And then the part that is, is, is important about this is not only can I test things locally or do a lint locally or whatever I need to do, but I also can actually hook this into the build system, which can do the continuous delivery. So how would we do this? That's a great question. Well, one of the ways that we can do this is that uh, I can actually set up the GitHub environment. And that's that's what this code does right here. Notice this dot GitHub. Uh, GitHub has a build server that is similar to other cloud-based build servers like AWS Code Build, for example, would be a competitor. And if we go through here, we can double click on this and look, we have uh, so the exact same thing I did here, make install, make lint, make test, right? These are the 
the key components of what it is that we need to build out. And they're all available right here for me using this particular uh, process. So, so how would I actually get this running with GitHub? Well, we already have connection, right? Because, because I cloned the repo. So all I need to do is actually look at that GitHub project and take a look at it and see this, you know, basically see it in action. So I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, throw that onto our terminal here and we'll, we'll come back to the cloud nine environment, but here's a, um, a GitHub uh, environment here, which is that same project. How would I actually get this thing working? Well, pretty easily, if I go to actions, this uh, dialog box here, you can see that I have all the different runs of this project. And if I wanted to, I could just click on one of these, like the latest build, and just click rerun all jobs. Uh, and what'll happen is it'll go through and do those exact same steps. So this seems simple. It's like, you know, why, why, why are you showing this? But it's fundamental, right? This is a fundamental component of all projects is, is get this structure working so you can just type in, make a, you know, make a virtual environment, CD into your directory, and then do make all. Once you've got that set up and then those changes, every time they're made, it reruns the build server. You've got those DevOps best practices, you know, created in your project. And so here we go. We see that the build was successful right now. If I want to show you why the continuous integration is so useful is also if I want to just change something here, like here we go. This is a sample repo. I put a dot, you know, to just make a small change. You can see every time I make a change, it'll automatically trigger the build. There we go. So we click on this. Look, it's building again. Right, so this is the virtuous circle of building software automatically uh, every time uh, I want to make changes to it. So now that we've got this set up, we, we see how, how useful it is. What else can we do in order to, to test out this workflow? So if I go to the uh, MLOps cookbook here, go to here, MLOps cookbook. Let's, let's take a look at a slightly more complex project that uses the same style. So in this particular scenario, we can see that I've got a lot more things inside, but the core concept is still there. Even though this one has machine learning inside of it, the same things there, a make file where I do an install test lint and I do a, a make all. So let's go ahead and, and, and test this out uh, and see what else it can do. So in this particular environment, I've got tons of different files. I can push this to different locations, right? I can, I can push it to a Flask app, a Click app, a container. I can push to many different cloud environments, all, all this stuff I can do, but I can also use the same core structure that I used before. I just go to code and I just type in this and I copy this link. Now I'm gonna go back to uh, AWS and we'll go to AWS console here and let's go back to my Cloud9 environments and let's try this out and, and see if this works. Okay, let's go ahead and see MLOps best practices. Perfect. This should take just a second to wake back up. Yep, we're all ready to go. So all I need to do is just CD up here and uh, close these things. Close this, close this right there. And I'm gonna say get clone. There we go. Now we're in this MLOps repo, I can do the same thing. I can I can go into Python MLOps cookbook. And, and in this case, I could actually um, do a make install and everything should work in a very, very similar way. Uh, in, in this case though, it's gonna, it's gonna actually um, take slightly different package versions though, uh, because I have a slightly different uh, project, but other than that, things should be very, very similar. And when it's done, it'll do a small uh, lint, it'll do a small test, and hopefully all those things pass and we know our project is good to go. Perfect. Everything, everything was able to, to, to work uh, well here. And again, if I go through here, we, we see that I think I ran make install, but I can do a make lint 
double check that our linting works, which would lint our command line tool, which we'll get into in a little bit. It'll, it'll lint our library, everything works. Same with test, if I say make test, everything works as well. So this is again, the foundational component to being able to work with machine learning operations. This repo here. So what I did was, uh, is, is essentially check out this uh, repo where I have the Python MLOps uh, cookbook project CD into this and, and the same things apply, right? So this is the, the same concept of the initial continuous integration uh, and everything looks very similar, right? So we can go through here and we can see that uh, there's a make file right here. And in, in this case, I can do the same steps installation. I can also do a test. I can also do a format. I can also do a lint. Uh, and I configure the project lint uh, according to anything that I'd want to do. So uh, in this particular scenario, maybe I would have some warnings or errors that I don't care about. You know, I, I would test a library, te test command line tool, those kinds of things. Uh, and then finally, if I want to just have it all run together, it would just build off of that prior knowledge. I just type in make all. So let's go ahead and do this. We'll type in make all. And this will give us the ability to install the packages, lint it, uh, and test it. Really, this is the, the foundational component to, to get things working. And there we go. So we've got everything working. And, and really, this is a nice step because then it enables us to kind of move to the next uh, component of what I wanted to share, which is let's now build out a command line tool that allows us to interact with this platform. And so let's take a look at how we could do that. So if we go to this project right here, CLI, notice that uh, what I like to do when I'm building a command line tool for uh, a machine learning project is I like this click library. I also like the fire library. That's another library that I like to use. Uh, but in either case, I like libraries where they make it so all you need to do is map a function to a command line tool. In this particular uh, example here, this project uh, is going to accept the weight uh, uh, of a player and then predict what their height would be for a major league baseball player. So it's kind of a simple example here to, to make the execution of the simple example easy to explain. Uh, but in this case, we can see that uh, in order to do this and click, all I need to do is say from mllib and I import my library right here that does the prediction. And then if I go through here and I say uh, at click command, at click option, uh, I would pass in this weight. I would pass in this prompt, which would be the major league uh, baseball player's weight, uh, pass this into command line tool right here and I would do a prediction. And again, this prediction is just from a library that I wrote, and then I clean it up a little bit uh, and make it in hu human readable form. And then finally, I add a little bit of styling to it. Like if it's over one value, then I do one thing. If it's under, I do another. So let's go ahead and uh, run this thing. Uh, CLI like this, help. Uh, and then in this particular scenario here, we say predicts height of an MLB player based on weight. How would I go ahead and do this? I would just type in uh, the weight and then put, let's say 200 pounds. What do we see? Ah, six foot two. What happens if I put 175 pounds, uh, six foot? What if I put in 155? We see five foot 11, right? So we've got this thing that predicts based on what your weight is, what um, height most likely a major league baseball player would be. And we've, we've got this feedback loop working. So let's see how I actually created that. Well, what I did was I went into uh, this, this little library file here and I encapsulated all of the code that I needed for my machine learning project. So I have some imports here. In this case, I'm importing NumPy, Pandas, scikit-learn, I'm importing a scaling system, and I'm also importing uh, the ability to train uh, a model uh, with a split. And so the, here's the little functions that I wrote. So first of all, 
I grab a model off of disk. And that's what this uh, bit of code does. Uh, and then I just return back that model. Fortunately, in this example, it's pretty straightforward. I have a serialized model right here, model.joblib, and I'm able to import it. I also have a library here that can read in uh, data that I need to do scaling, for example. And then I have some code right here that allows me to retrain the model. So if I wanted to train it again, how would I do this? I could change the training size, for example, and you know maybe use more training data or less training data, depending on what it is that I'm trying to do. And you see, I've got that built in there and I use a scaler because all machine learning models with a couple of exceptions require you to scale the data, essentially make it all between zero and one uh, in relative terms uh, in order to, to train the model. And then uh, I go through here and I, I return back the model and the accuracy when I, re when I retrain it. I also have this, which is formats the input. I have some scale input. I have scale the target. I have some helper code that goes through and converts the format so that I can make that nice command line tool. And then I also have something that returns back a human payload. And then finally, this is the predict function, is it kind of ties all that stuff together so that I, I'm able to actually do a prediction and then return back this, this payload. So this is really the essence of kind of tying all this stuff together is that I make something that is, you know, maybe 120 lines of code simpler by just importing this inside of a library and saying from mllib predict. That's it. There's there's one line of there's one line of code and then I just do predict. So behind the scenes all the work is happening. I think this is also a great idea when you're building out a project is to try to build some structure out so that you just do an import predict and then you don't have to have all this stuff polluting all of the code. You you can then use that predict for a command line tool, microservice, a container, all that's all that's set up for you. Let me also show you the utility script that's also a command line tool. Let's take a look at this. So this is a, a second command line tool. And uh, what this thing does is it allows us to retrain uh, the model uh, by just putting in the training size here. And, and then I could actually go through here and, and try it out. So let's go ahead and, and do that. So if I go through here and I say, um, utils CLI and I do help it gives us a menu and we can see machine learning utility bill so if I wanted to build out other things in my project uh, in this case it can also do predictions to other endpoints I would just put more and more of these commands inside and this is how it works with click is you just say at CLI dot command and it will put a section for you inside of your your command uh, and then you can have lots of different things. It could be, you know, I don't know, migrate the model to a model registry or, you know, um, serve this out via a different endpoint or, or whatever it is you wanted to do. I think this structures or great structures have also a second command line tool that you can do maybe operational types of things. So in this case, I want to do this one. I want to say retrain the model. Uh, in this case, I just make it do something very simple, which is in this, the default is uh, 0.01. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's just do um, retrain just like this. And now I've been able to retrain the model and it shows me the model accuracy. If I want to change the, um, the training size, I could try some different values. I could say, what about less data or more data? Right, you can see by using uh, more data, it actually makes the model less accurate. So I could kind of experiment here with what what does the best, and it looks like maybe a smaller training size uh, has a has a better accuracy in this particular situation. A little bit of a toy example, but it kind of goes with the the idea of building these small little tools that help you build out the the ecosystem you know, for, for your project. So this is just one command line tool, uh, but what if I wanted to take this and show other types of command line tools and other types of projects before we get into uh, building out microservices, how would I do this? Well, I have another project here that, that I'll put into our screen here in a second. Let me just pull this up. 
<clears throat> so here's a uh, here's another project that double checking that this shows up. There we go. This is another project that is a Databricks uh, based project using a framework called MLflow. So in the previous example, all I showed was uh, basically a, a non-framework version of, of MLOps. This is actually using a particular framework that's designed to do a lot of different automations around uh, machine learning projects. And in particular, this MLflow project here, you can see I've got similar type, types of things. I have a Docker file, make file, I have some libraries, I have some command line scripts, th those kinds of things. But in particular, this is something that that I wanted to, to, to walk through and show, which is how would you build an end-to-end -end, uh, MLOps system with a platform now? And, and how would I actually test this out and, and build out some workflow like this? So this would be, I think, a, a very realistic example of a project that you would build in an organization uh, or if you were going to work with a big data project in a university setting or something like that this is what you would do and, and again there's lots of these different kinds of platforms to do this this one is a spark based platform uh, so first you need, need to identify your data set in this particular scenario here we could grab some data set from Kaggle uh, and it's fortunately pretty straightforward to download some kind of a data set from Kaggle, do something with it. Then I would upload that into their uh, Databricks platform. Next, what I would do is I would uh, use the Databricks file system UI to create a table. All a table is, is it's a distributed um, data structure that allows you to work with that data using a, a cluster of machines. Then uh, this is a now an emerging thing that's happening is that I could go through here and I could create an AutoML experiment. I could register the best model and then I could serve out that model via a Databricks uh, endpoint. And what's, what's great about this is that I could be done if I wanted to and just use that Databricks platform by itself. Or what I could do is I could actually go through here and build this out into a cloud-based development environment like we're using as well. So both are, are actually reasonable options. And you could use Cloud Shell, Cloud9, Code Spaces, you know, whatever it is you wanted to use. And then ultimately what you want to do is you want to push something to a container registry and then you could deploy a, a containerized microservice and put that uh, into production. So, and again, you can use command line tools to, to interact with this initially as well. So what I think would be a good thing to show would be uh, to, to kind of walk you through this workflow uh, and, and, and see you know, what it's like in order to, to build this out. And then I'll also come back to the other example as well. So we'll, we'll, have, we'll have two, two totally different styles that, that we go through. So in this particular uh, scenario, what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to actually uh, move over to uh, Azure. So let's go ahead and go to Azure here. And I'm going to go ahead and sign in. The only reason I'm using Azure in this particular scenario, it doesn't, it could be any cloud platform, is that it has actually integration with uh, Databricks. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, paste this in real quick so that we see it. Here we go. Okay, so we've got we've got an Azure window populated here. And so if I wanted to uh, go ahead and uh, play around with this, uh, we, we can actually, it looks like we're, 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 we're in good shape here. Um, if we if we want to actually go through here and uh, and use Azure Databricks, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just spin up uh, uh, an ecosystem that I've probably already got set up here. I'm gonna go ahead and launch this workspace uh, and we'll go ahead and kick the tires on this thing. So to start off with, uh, these platforms you know, are, are very similar you know, in the sense that 
they, they give you a one-stop shop to organize things. And in particular, the one I'm going to use is this machine learning interface right here. And uh, I can actually go through here and look at previous models. And we see that I've got some, you know, models here that I that I've built out uh, previously, including uh, a fake news predictor. And then additionally, I have a compute cluster that I've been able to, to spin up that I could use for for jobs. So let's go ahead and create a cluster so you see how this process works uh, because it's similar in many platforms. If we go ahead and we create a cluster, we could say, you know, um, MLOps cluster. And, and so the thing to remember with a cluster uh, to be aware of, and let me just go ahead and do this. We'll just do this here. <clears throat> here we go. We see the cluster creation screen. The, the thing to, to be aware of in this particular screen here is that we can actually go through and um, and say, you know, MLOps cluster like this. And, and notice that uh, this cluster in particular, there's a, a few different options. You can do a single node, which is which is a good way to play around with the maybe a notebook inside of Databricks, or you could do standard. In this case, uh, you notice that it gives you these configs here where you have a minimum number of workers, a max number of workers. This kind of style is probably a good style, right, is to to have the ability to spin up if you need to. And then likewise, the other thing to be aware of is the runtime. And this is really interesting because this is where the pandas library that I showed earlier, and I mentioned it was a small data problem, or library starts to be a little bit of an issue is that is that if you want to use the pandas API and, and things to, to be very similar to pandas, then most likely you need to use a library uh, that has the ability to treat things like pandas would treat them, even though it's not exactly like pandas. And with Databricks, uh, the 10.0 the 10 and, and beyond version, you can actually do this. So in this case, if I wanted to, I could just spin up 10.4, which is you know Spark 321, and go ahead and say, you know start cluster, create cluster right here. And this should just launch a, a cluster for me. There we go. We, we, we've got this thing. Uh, we've got this thing working. And and while that's spinning up, what I'll what I'll show you is just some of these other components of a of a platform ecosystem. Is that we have a workspace, which I'll, I'll show right here. And this workspace uh, has your own you know projects inside of them. And in particular, what you would do in a workspace like this is you typically would you know have like experiments that you're working on notebooks that you're working on uh and and all those 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 pieces of the ecosystem uh, are available for you to take a look at and and, and go back and forth on and, and in particular this would be a good one to show you is the pandas the pandas api a notebook notice that in this particular example that you can see that we can actually use big data inside of a notebook by using this new PySpark.pandas uh, interface. And so what it does is it makes things look very, very similar to the, the way pandas would work. And so you can use all of the skills you've learned from pandas and apply them to Spark. And so why would you care about this? Well, the, the big reason is that if it's big data, you can't use pandas, right? Pandas doesn't work on big data sets. It works with smaller data sets, like let's say under a gigabyte. If you have a 10 gigabyte data set or a terabyte data set, you, you have no choice. You have to use a different type of library, either Dask or, or, or PySpark or something like this. So in this particular scenario, all we need to do is use PySpark.pandas as PS. And so now in order to run this example, what I'll need to do is go through here and attach it to a cluster that, that I've actually got spun up here. So we'll, we'll just wait for this for a second. It should take just a second for this uh, cluster to, to run. And, and notice, actually, while this, is, while this is spinning up, I'll show you, you can also go to Compute, and you can take a look at this, and you can also see the, 
the pending action and it'll tell you how many nodes are, are actually running. You also can see other clusters that I've created like GPU clusters, you know, uh, different versions of Spark, all these kinds of things here. But the, the, I guess a big, a big takeaway is that you can dive into this and, and kind of take a look at things. Now you can also look at the event log as well with, with a cluster, which is also kind of a good idea. If you ever have a problem with the cluster, like terminating or, or things like that, uh, this is a great way to, to, to debug it. And here we go. We'll just kind of let this thing refresh here. You also can look at the metrics of the cluster. And this is important to be aware of because of the fact that w once this thing spins up, is if you are doing big data operations, it can be a little bit uh, cumbersome to to actually deal with you know memory outages or or like CPU problems. And so the only way to look at that sometimes is to look at the metrics, right? You go through here, you look at the metrics, uh, you look at the logs, you look at all these different things. Uh, and, and this is a great place to to kind of take a look at all that stuff. So we'll just give this a second here to, to spin up. I think it's is it even ready? It might be it might be ready. Uh, and I can go back to that workspace and go to this library if it's ready. There we go. It looks like it's good to go. So great. We got we, we got our cluster running. And in fact, we could see how many nodes are running in this cluster. Let's go ahead and see. Okay, three nodes are, are running this cluster. So we have a nice a nice powerful cluster here. So let's go ahead and, and take a look at how you would use pandas on a Spark cluster so that we have the background so that we can then do the machine learning. So first up, what I would say would be we could look how, again, PySpark.pandas SPS. I just do a shift or turn. It goes ahead and, and runs this uh, as a Spark job. And so it's basically running this on the back end. Then look, I can do the same things. I can, here's a regular pandas data frame pd.series. Here's a PySpark data frame. Pretty, pretty nice. There we go. And then I could go through here and I could just play around with some of this, this code here. So very, very similar. Likewise, if I want to create a data frame in pandas, here's a good data frame in pandas pd. But then also look, the ps data frame, it works almost identically, right? And so I could go through here run this as a Spark job, uh, do P, PDF, PDF sort, PSDF sort, right? All this, the operations are, are, are similar. If I wanna look at the PS, which is the, the PySpark data frame, as pandas, identical, right? Things are, things are very, very similar you know, with, with, with PySpark here. So that's, that's really the main takeaway here, is that you can actually do similar things with, with PySpark as the pandas interface. And then finally, this is something that, that I like to do a lot, is I can apply a function to a data frame, right? Now, again, if this is big data, you, know, it, it would, you, you wouldn't be able to run it if it was on pandas, but because I have Spark, I can do all these things. So that's just more of like kicking the tires a little bit about why, why it's so powerful. But now let's take a look at the file system itself. So let's go to data right here. And in order to upload data into here, there's a few different ways to do it. But one of the ways to do it is you just click on create table. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. And this will use the cluster to kind of interact with that data, the, one, the, the cluster that we just sent up. And if I go create table right here, uh, I could just go ahead and drop some file, whatever file I wanted to. I just drop it inside of here. And then it would go ahead and it would create a table. That's it. Very, very straightforward. In fact, we could do that by actually going to um, Kaggle and, and actually finding, you know, finding something from 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 Kaggle and downloading. It. In fact, I'll do that. Let's let me just uh, put this this uh, URL in my in my buffer so I can come back to it. And then if we go to Kaggle here, you can see a project in Kaggle that's called a fake news classification. So this would be a great way to prototype out a big data MLOps workflow is I could just find this project, click on download, download this data set, and, you, and it, this will just pop up onto my, my screen here. I'm, I'm able to download it. And then uh, what I can do 
is I can actually just use that data set and, and, and upload it into, into my, my uh, Databricks ecosystem. So I'm gonna now go back to my, um, my Databricks environment and I'm gonna go to this create table dialog box and now I just go ahead and I click this button and I say, okay, let's look at my desktop and let's find that, that uh, data set here, which I think is called uh, news articles. Here we go. News articles, great. And, and, and now I'm gonna upload this inside. And then I'll show you, there's only a couple steps in order to, to put this into our code, into our um, data, Databricks file system. Let's go ahead and do this. Okay, now I'm gonna click create table with UI and then it's gonna say select a cluster. So this again shows how you, you have to have a running cluster. That's that's one of the big differences between the project I just showed you with, I have a, a model and we're kind of working with things in a very simple way. This is a big data operation, so I also have to have a cluster running. So I pick that cluster right here and I say preview table. Okay, and now, it's gonna go through and look at that data set for me. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and look at that data set. Notice here that it's gonna create a table name. Because I've uploaded this a few times, it's gonna increment the name up, but it's the news articles. And then I could just tell a little bit of information, like the first row's a header, and also, why don't you infer the schema? There we go. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. Perfect. Now let's go ahead and say create table. And let's go ahead and take a look at this. All right, so we see now a nice structure, right? We have a schema, we have the column names here. This shows all the columns that are in this particular data set. So again, this data set could be any size. I mean, it could be, in this case, it's it's only six megabytes, but it could have been six gigabytes or six terabytes, and we would just spin up the cluster to meet those demands. And then it shows you the different um, data types as well. And we can see here there's sample data, right? Published, the title, all that kind of stuff. So great, we have we have a a good data set here to to play around with. Uh, and uh, now, if I go back to data, you should see that that's the one I just uploaded. So how would we do machine learning, right? Because that's the point of this whole thing, right? Is to do machine learning, and then later, you know, make predictions with it. Well, on this particular platform, what's pretty neat about it is that I can again select this machine learning. Um, interface here, I'm gonna go ahead and go to this one. And I'm gonna to go to something called experiments. So I'm gonna click on this button called experiments. And all I need to do now, once I've uploaded the data set to the cluster is, is create an auto ML experiment. And in this particular example here, I'm gonna go ahead and select a, a cluster. And this should, the cluster should be available Ah, so in this particular, uh, this is a great example. I need to spin up a second kind of cluster. So you you have to pick the right cluster for the job that you have at hand. You could sometimes when you're doing ED, ETL, you may have one kind of cluster. I just need to create a second kind of cluster, which is not a problem. I'm going to go to compute here, and I'm going to create a different cluster, and I'm going to call this one. Um, actually, I'm going to use a cluster I've already created because I think that'll speed things up. Notice that this one right here, if I click on it, it says ML cluster. And look at the difference. It has the ML runtime in the cluster, right? And that's the, the, the difference is there's ML clusters and non-ML clusters. The ML clusters have uh, ML flow installed on it, which is a library we're gonna use in a little bit. But ML flow allows you to interact with the ecosystem and, and basically play around with with uh, machine learning operations. So I'm gonna go ahead and click start. And this one will we'll go ahead and, and start this cluster.
okay. This looks like it's it's able to to spawn here, and we could probably even um, get rid of that other cluster if I go to compute. I could even tell this cluster, hey, I'm done with you. Let's go ahead and, and stop. And I'm just going to use this particular MO cluster. Now, one of the things to, to keep in mind is that if you use the ML cluster, I could have used the ML cluster for both the, the Databricks file system and also the experiments. So you don't necessarily have to have two clusters, but depending on what kind of jobs you're, you're working on, what kind of things you're doing, you may have potentially a couple different clusters, which I did show in the previous diagram with SageMaker, which works in a similar way. Sometimes you'll have clusters that are de designated for certain operations like principal component analysis cluster, a k-means cluster, a ETL cluster, an inference cluster. You know, this is just the nature of working with uh, really large data. Uh, and in this particular scenario here, we're just going to wait for this thing to launch. And this won't take too long. We can look at the event log here. And you can see here that the um, uh, the history is a great place to take a look at uh, how things run. Uh, and you can see all the different times I've terminated it. Notice that I've got this thing set up to auto terminate after 120 minutes, which is a great way to save on, on cost. And the way I did that, if I go to configuration, is notice how this is by default a setup like this. It says, A, enable auto scaling, that controls cost, right? Because it would be minimum three, maximum eight. Also terminate after 120 minutes of activity. And this allows us to uh, not have to worry about uh, pr really leaving this cluster running and being charged for it. That's a very common problem with cloud computing is that you leave something running and you forget to, to use it. Fortunately, with this particular platform, they actually have the auto scaling setup A and then B, the termination afterwards. And also you can go to the event log here and you can double check to make sure that everything is auto terminating. So notice how I've been using this cluster a lot lately and it, and it terminates uh, every single time that I, that I do it. Now notice I could even take a guess here as well. And, and take a guess for how long it'll take to spin up a cluster. Look, this was something I did a few days ago. I was I spun up the cluster at 14.02 uh, EDT and noticed that it took about, it takes about four minutes to spin up a cluster. Let's see, I did it again here. This one took about five minutes. So it takes four to five minutes to, to spin up a cluster. Uh, typically, in this particular example, again, this is the machine learning cluster. Uh, and I also, if I wanted to, I could look at historical snapshots of things as well, uh, which is kind of neat uh, if I wanted to, to, to take, take a look at um, different, different bits of data about how this runs. So we'll just give this a couple more minutes here to, to spin up. Okay, we got this thing. Event log, 6.32. So yeah, probably like another minute, and this, this should be ready to go. I guess I could go back to that interface, again, the experiments interface here. And uh, when, it's, when it's available, it'll, it'll, it'll pop up here, which again, I think is very close to being available. That's just the nature of working with uh, big data is you have to use clusters and clusters can be a little bit sluggish sometimes to work with because they have to spin up. And this is the virtual machine issue that I think potentially could be solved in the future by more of a Kubernetes based workflow. And I also, I think we'll have some time to show a Kubernetes based platform that can solve some of these scale issues in terms of like waiting for the virtual ma machine for four or five minutes. I think this is a legacy issue that eventually will go away, which is that do we really need to wait four or five minutes every time we spin up a cluster? Uh, I think no, in the future, I don't think we'll, we'll see this kind of a workflow uh, at all. Here we go, cluster event log. Give this just a little bit more 
more time. There, it looks like it's ready to go. So if I refresh this, cluster is running, great. Okay, so now we can do our, our, our machine learning. Let's go back to experiments, create auto milk experiment. The cluster is available, perfect. And, and then really there's not that much to configure here. And, and in this particular problem, I'm gonna select classification because I wanna classify the fake news. And now all I have to do is pick the data set. Now, I just go to the Databricks file system right here. And, and I, now I've uploaded this thing many times, so I, I, I can just pick any of them. In this case, I'll pick the, I think this is the one I did recently. And then all I need to do is select the prediction target. And I could also select, you know, what a, what parts of the data I wanted to use. So I could get rid of some of these if I if I didn't want to keep all of them. In fact, that could be kind of interesting if I just wanted to keep only the text potentially. That would be make it simpler to 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 do a prediction system. So that that that's a new iteration I haven't tried yet, which is essentially if I want to just make a proof of concept really quickly instead of having all those columns. Why don't we just pick one that only uses the text? And that way, when I create an inference with this, it'll be really, really simple. And I'll, and I'll show this later because I have a bunch of code that interacts with this model. So let's go ahead and uh, pick a, a prediction target. What would that be? In this case, it's the label. That's what the original author created, which would be fake news or, or true news. And then I just say the experiment name. And in fact, uh, maybe I'll even put a little, you know, note here that says um, text only or something like that. So I know that this is a simpler, um, a simpler inference because w when I do do the prediction, I'll only need to use text, which will, which will be great in terms of creating an endpoint. So then I go through here and I say, okay, create auto ML. Now, now this is really. I think amazing because I think this is the future of these kinds of platforms is that you ingest your data. It's a big data problem. You initially do a proof of concept with AutoML. I don't see why you wouldn't use AutoML, even if later you're going to go through and tune over everything yourself. Why would you not use it? It's almost like continuous integration is, in my opinion, similar to AutoML. It's like an automated system that just kind of flushes things out like you 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 see how things are running now notice in this particular example here it'll start training our model and it'll it'll show many different kinds of algorithms many different kinds of hyperparameters all this stuff will will show up here and it says uh oh possible data issues are are shown and then you could even look at a data exploration notebook while this is actually training uh, look, it says nulls in target common uh, column. AutoML dropped it right uh, between 1024 and 665536. Different values in categorical columns. You know, it, it can actually fix a lot of these issues that would would normally come up. What is kind of neat though is it does give you while this thing's running a, a data exploration notebook. And let's go ahead and take a look at this. So I'll um, put this into our into our screen here so we can take a look at it. But in, in this particular example, this is a, a data exploration notebook. I can actually attach it to our cluster because our cluster is a big cluster. It's doing lots of different things. But what's neat about this is, is that it, it generated an exploratory data analysis for us, right? Which again is amazing. Like as for me, uh, being a fan of automation, why not? Why wouldn't I want some one of these kinds of tools to be available for me? So let's take a look. Let's see how, how things work. So the first thing that I've got here is I import the OS model uh, module, import UUID, shutil. So these are standard library functions in Python. Shutil is used to move data around. I import pandas as PD. And then I also import the Databricks AutoML runtime. So the first thing we do is this is just uh, essentially download some data and put it into pandas. That, that's the first thing we do. Now notice this, we also use this thing called the MLflow client. We're gonna get into MLflow later, but basically MLflow uh, is 
something that it keeps track of experiments, lets us talk to a model versioning, all those kinds of things. And then look, I do pd.readparquet. So it's able to read that training data. So let's go ahead and run this. There we go. That's running this command. And then the next thing is we profile the data. So let's, let's go ahead and say from pandas profile import profile report. Okay. And let's see, uh, take a look at what it generates. There we go. So all this is going to give us here initially is it says, okay, we're going to only have two variables. We're going to have 2,000 observations. Uh, there's 45 missing cells. So only 1% of the data is missing. There's 104 duplicate rows, duplicate rows percentage, total size. We're only going to de deal with text here. And notice that it uh, it's looking at a bunch of... Uh, uh, you know, um, URLs. I guess we're using uh, potentially URLs as well inside of here. And here's the label that there's four different kinds of labels. There's one fake, zero, real. We can see the different missing values and we can see a sample first row as well. So I guess it's got both German and English uh, fake news uh, categorization. Now I haven't tried this one in particular, here's du duplicate rows most frequently appearing. I guess these are some fake news websites. But basically, the um, we'll see how this turns out. I'm not trying to train the model just on um, text only, but but basically it's going to go through here and and train this model. But it does give us this initial dump, so we can see some information about the the way it was actually created. So from here. I can just go back to experiments and this should pop up the experiments tab here next. There we go. And here's that experiment. Okay. And we can watch this thing track machine learning ex runs and experiments. There we go. It's, all, it's already complete. How well did it do? Eh, not that, I mean, because I got rid of some of that other data, the model definitely is not as accurate as other models I created, but it has some accuracy. It, it, it's at least got uh, the best one. We, and we look, we can click on this notebook. It, it's at least good enough for proof of concept. If we go through here, we say view notebook, for example, it'll actually go through here and show us the notebook that it created. So this is another thing I really like about this automail style is it even shows me how to interact with the model so I can, so I can uh, play around with it. So here we go. Next up, I do this. I say attach to the cluster. Sure, let's attach and run. Let's load the data. This goes through and it loads the data. And it shows a bunch of uh, the fake news here, which I guess is in German. We select the supported columns. In this case, I'm only going to use text. And then uh, I look at preprocessors. I look at um, some other some other bits of data we we'll go through and run this and this shows the uh, categorical data the transformation so it so it even does all of the the normal uh, natural language processing things for you it does uh, scaling for you it goes through and it does train validation test split of course you could always change this right like if you want to if you want to change this and this is why I, I mean I think it's so great to, to be able to um, to see this because I can always riff off of what the algorithm, the auto mail algorithm came up with. And then we go through here and we train the model. In this case, this would be logistic regression. Uh, and then this one does an auto log here. So it starts this ML flow uh, tracking run here and it, and it gives us our, our, final, our final accuracy. And then finally, if I wanted to, I could look at the feature importance and it could show us different you know feature importance things and then and then this is the part we're going to get into after we take a break which is okay now i want to start taking this model and i want to start and I, now now i want to here we go let's go ahead and put this in here <clears throat> this is the this is the, sorry again the 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 screen sharing system here unfortunately has changed <laughs> so it, it 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 can get stuck so just just alert me i'm paying attention but basically this 
this library here is is uh, this notebook it basically shows us the whole system here which which uh, basically is the notebook that's generated right so i can say uh, import ml flow uh, i can do loading the data right here um, we can we can uh, select the supporting columns all the stuff we in fact i can just go through all these cells and just go through and run them the the key the key idea with all these 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 bits of code here that i'm showing is that it gives me all of the things that I need to do to later, you know, basically interact with this model, which, which from an operational standpoint is great. In fact, in particular, we can see that the the model I can actually interact with the model registry. I can load the model and download it. In fact, look at this piece of code right here, and 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 notice that we see that the MLflow PyFunk load model here would be. All I would need to do is use that piece of code to, to load our model. So it's very similar to what I did earlier with the MLops cookbook recipe. Uh, and, and, it's, and this is what's nice about using a, a platform-based system. So now that I've got all this stuff working, what we can do next here is actually interact with the model after we get back from break. And so I'll show you this. This is the model right here. And, and, and we see that uh, I could actually say create model if I wanted to and create a new one, or I could take one of the other models that I had earlier uh, and, and actually interact with it. In fact, if I go back here, we could actually keep going back and we could go to experiments, click on this notebook. And if you click on this final one right here, which I think we could sort by accuracy, here we go. Here's that's eh, a pretty decent one. Here we go. This is not horrible accuracy. If I take this model, notice that it, it gives me a uh, a whole like uh, payload here. So let me let me throw this into the the screen so we all can see it. So once I click on a model, it, it will actually give me all of this information about the metadata uh, of the model, including the 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 things that I'm going to need, for example, the a file that describes the model, like the metadata of it right here, a conda YAML if I needed to use it, or a requirements. So it gives me either one, in this particular example, and then it gives me actually the serialized model itself, and then it shows me how to interface with it. So in this case, look, it gives me like a nice payload that I could build a command line tool and interact with this. So this is really, in my opinion, amazing, this kind of a system, because from an MLOps perspective, I just clicked some buttons and then it's got everything I need now to build tooling, to build microservices, all this kind of stuff around this. So I think this would be the, the next step that we'll do is I'll be able to download this thing and we can use it to build, build systems. And so really it's, it's, it's ready to go. In fact, I could just click on this, on this button right here and download this, this whole artifact, or I could register the model. And, and notice when I click on this, is it even gives me the, the ways I could import it into a library as well, just like this. But what I'm gonna do to make it simple is I'm gonna click on register model right here. And I'm gonna say create new model and we'll call this text only fake news or something like that like that and then i'm going to register this model once it's registered what's nice about this is it's going to make it so much easier for me to interact with it and play around with this uh, particular uh, ecosystem and we can build out a whole structure in fact around this if i go to models right here we should see there we go text only fake news and I, now I could serve it out as well uh, via the endpoint, which I think I'll do as well. But we're all in great shape to, to start building command line tools with this again, and then also serving it out via. Next up, I've got the Chrome tab, and we're on this models page. So let's go ahead and take a look at this models page here. Okay, great. So in this particular scenario here, notice that I have this text only fake news. 
And so what I can do is I can select it and then I can select use model for inference. And if we click on use model for inference, notice that we can do batch based inference uh, or which would just be like a one off prediction or we could do real time. Let's go ahead and pick this real time, which and what this would do is it would just serve this out via a virtual machine. So we'll go ahead and and click this use model for inference. And I believe if I go to serving now, notice that it says pending and we can even look at cluster settings and you can see that it's going to pick a small, a smaller type of uh, instance and it's going to serve that out. And we could look at the model events here as well. And we could, we could kind of watch this thing spin up and we, we could also look at the model version here and notice that where it says call the model, it, we can actually, actually ask it for examples of, of what to put into the model uh, right here. And, and it will give us like payloads that, that we could actually send into the model and then we'll be able to get a response. We could also look at a curl as well, which would be this one, or we could even look at a Python example and see how to actually you know, uh, import it without using any library. So I'm gonna let that thing spin up, but what I wanted to show what I, what I wanted to show next here is that we could go back to this registered model here and we could look at the ID that's available with it, which I think is going to be, let's find the ID for this thing. Well, we can find the ID actually in the notebook that was created, which is going to be this one, notebook. Here we go. Here's the tracking ID. So, so in order to, to download this model, we, we would need to have this particular ID right here if we wanted to, to download it. And you can see that in, in, in this one right here. And so what we could do is I'm going to put this into another window so I have it. But I can now start to create a project that plays around with this particular model and, and, we, could, and we could download it. And we'll come back to the endpoint. But basically, if I go to, to GitHub here, we can, we can play around with this thing. So I'm going to open up GitHub. And then I'm going to go to uh, ML flow project best practices, this repo right here. And notice that I have a bunch, again, this is the, the repo that has this high level architecture here uh, inside of it. And in particular, this, this high level architecture, you can see that this is what we did. We went to Kaggle, we created a file system, we did AutoML, we registered the best model. We also clicked the serve, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually interact now in a cloud-based development environment. In this case, I think to start with, I could, I could probably play around with it in initially in GitHub code spaces. That'd probably be a, a, a good environment to, to play around with it in. And then later we'll, we'll push this out via a containerized microservice. So we can kind of almost pretend that Databricks doesn't exist now, if we want to, right? We can just download the model and just start playing around with it. So let's go ahead and, and experiment with how to do that. So first up, I'm gonna click on this button up here called code, and I'm, I'm going to actually go to a code space. I'm gonna create a, I'm gonna take this existing code space that I had set up a while back, and I'm going to open this up. And this is similar to AWS Cloud9 in that it allows me to like test out ideas and, and play around with the code inside of this uh, code space. And let me show you a couple things that, that we can do. One uh, thing that we can do is that we can actually list all of the mo models that are available in this tracking system. And this is actually very interesting is that in a traditional standalone scikit-learn type environment. Actually, let me change the background to make this a little bit uh, easier on the eyes. I'm gonna change the color to um, Visual Studio Dark. There we go, that's a little bit easier for me. The, 
what's nice here though about this is notice that this particular uh, piece of code will will go into uh, the Databricks system and it will then say, look, show me all of the different models that are registered. So let's, let's, let's try it out. Let's go ahead and say Python list models. And then notice that it will make an API call because I, I created an, a Databricks token earlier. So this is an environmental variable that, that now I have a hook into the Databricks file system. And look, we should be, I could even grep the um, that model. I could just say fake something like this or grep, I need to grep like this. Here we go. Look, see that? That's the model I just created. Text only fake news. So pretty pretty neat actually that I, I've registered the model and now I, I can just pretend essentially Databricks doesn't exist. I can now start to treat this like, like its own um, project. And then the other thing that we could do is that um, I could also download the model. So check this out. So if I go here, notice that this is this is the the model, a, a different kind of model that I that I downloaded. But I could actually create a, a, a another version of this script or make a command tool or something like that, and, and put this model somewhere different. So what I'm going to do is I think I'll just swap this out like this with the new token or the new ID for the, the different model, the fake news one, right? Which is, I think if I look inside of here, it's this, it's uh, 68 AFF, it's this. It's basically this, this uh, payload. So I'm gonna go ahead and swap this out and, and see what happens. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's save this. And we'll say, first of all, let's look at what version of Python we're, we're using. Yeah, Python 3.8, I think that's good. Um, I think that this should probably work. And because the, the models have to be serialized in a certain uh, version of Python, the, I, I think there can sometimes be problems between Python 3.8 and 3.7, things like that. But, but for now, I think that this will work. I'm gonna go ahead and say a Python download model. There we go. And we're able to actually download this model. And look, it, it put the model inside of this directory right here, and we could look at it. We could do this, we could do ls-l, and, and uh, not that. I wanna look at the model location. And we'll go through here and we'll run this. Aha, so we, we see that it has a requirements file. It has the model right here. So really these are the two pieces of code that I really care about. And now what I could do is notice I have a model directory here, which is my other model that I had previously. I could just overwrite this, which I think is a good idea. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I'm going to um, I'm going to actually CP this data here inside of this directory, and I'm going to I'm going to overwrite my existing model. Let's go ahead and try that out and see what happens. We'll do this asterisk, and we'll do model here. There we go. And so if I say get status, it should be a different model, right? Because um, I changed the download model, I changed this and I change input example, right? Because the input example is now gonna be different because it should be really simple. Look, very easy, it's just one column, right? Which is, which is kind of neat because I, I don't have to do anything uh, at all to it now. And so from here, I could just say get status, right? I'll say, I'll commit this, get commit, and then say adding new model, there we go. Get and we'll, and we'll push this. Well, let's do a pull first. There we go. Merge. Yeah, and then we'll do a git push. So, so I got this 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 working. So, how would I build out a a, a script here or or some something that can that can actually interact with it? So, before I had to do this really large uh, example, I could actually get rid of all this. In fact. And I'm going to change this code because 
All I need to do is create a payload that has text in it. That's it, right? And so I'm going to create a data frame here that just puts something that looks fake inside. In fact, I could refer to the input example here that look at, it looks like the data, in fact, I could just co literally copy this payload to start with. Um, I believe I could just import this into Pandas. Let's, let's go ahead and try this. Because that's what's nice is it gives us the structure. And um, uh, let's type in IPython here. And we can say uh, import pandas as pd. And then I could say pd.dataframe. And I thought you can just throw that. No, that's that's a that's too big of a, a I think. Oh, this is a big piece of text here. Maybe I don't want to do that one. Um, text here. Aliens are coming. Let's just let's try that. Let's just try this piece of text. Aliens are coming. I'm going to make a data frame out of it, and then I can just really riff off of that code, which I did earlier, and. We could we could either we could either invoke the one externally or we should be able to to run the prediction here locally as well, which I think uh, would work. So we, we can either yeah we can basically either load this thing up locally uh, or we, we can make we can make a, a smaller one which let me just look at this thing, which would be using this. I think this is actually what we want to do is we want to actually, uh, I think it's at this point I could just build a, a, a Flask app. Actually, that would be easier. Let's go ahead and try this one. I'm, gonna, I'm changing the wrong one. So let's change this one, which is the text here. We'll put this, we'll keep the text. We'll keep this going here like that. So we have a, a very simple data frame right here that, that's going to be created. And, and notice that that's it. That's the only piece that I need to do is I say, load this model from disk right here. Load this model from disk that I just downloaded. And then this is the, the piece of code that will do the predict, uh, which will take the loaded model. And then I create an endpoint, in this case in Flask, that will go through here and it will use uh, this this text based input to make a prediction. And then I basically convert it to JSON and return back a JSON response. So let's go ahead and, and run this. That would be a good one to run. So let's go ahead and do this. I'll type in Python main.py and this should work. I guess we're about to find out. Okay, looks like it's running, that's good. Now, in this case, we, we could do this, uh, which I, I think I'll just need to, to, to uh, open this browser window here and um, paste this back into our window so we can, we can toggle back and forth, which does make things a little bit more complex, but let's try it out. So I can see this, and now in order to, to interact with this model, I can do docs. And so what's nice about this is that now I have a web service that is really knows, again, has no um, interface with Databricks. This is, at this point, we just have a model. It's using Fast API, which is a Python web, a web service. And we can just, we can basically just play around with this code. And so this is really uh, pretty awesome uh, in that uh, all I need to do now is is kind of package package this thing up and and, and do an import. So I, if I click on post, I should be able to try this out, this endpoint, and then say whatever it is I need to do. So you know, aliens are coming to invade Earth, right? Some kind of fake news story. Let's go ahead and see if it predicts that that's fake. And it, look, it says fake news, it returns back uh, one, uh, which I believe 
would be would be true. It's a it's a fake news story, uh, and so we're we're able to actually get this whole this this whole input here uh, back. So we're able to use this uh, endpoint here. Everything is is working uh, correctly, and then if I wanted to, I could I could build chameleon tools with this kind of style. I could build um, lots of different things using this this kind of a style. So that might be a good thing to to try out next is is to to see if we can also build like a nice little chameleon tool that can also import and, and play around with this this library and that will set us up to then be able to containerize both of these systems and then set up a continuous delivery so probably the next thing i would do once i've got something like this working it's like okay this looks like a, it's it's kind of kind of doing doing what i'm expecting it to do let's let's go back here to our to our um, GitHub code spaces, and let's 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 actually build out a command line tool that's kind of similar to this. So how would we do this? Well, first I'll stop this service, and I would say um, we'll call this local CLI predict, like this, like that. There we go. I have a local CLI, and then I'm just going to copy some of the code and, and tweak it, and I'm going to add as well inside of here. I'm going to add a the the click framework. So we'll go ahead and say click, add this to the bottom, and then I'll do a make install. And so, really, what I need to do is start to to take the pieces that work out, which would be the pieces inside of here. So I can probably take out this piece of code right here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this into my local CLI predict right here. And so I'm going to just uh, get some of these things working just in a script first. So I'd say import uh, pandas as PD. That would be good. And then I would also say uh, import ML flow and I think to start with this should be good enough for a script and we have a text loaded model perfect this loaded model in fact we can even put it we can even put this down here we can put this into this function right we can say load model as as a pyfunk model that looks good and now all I need to do to predict this is create a a, 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 a print statement that just says predicts and then put in the piece of text like I saw aliens from space or, or whatever fake news thing I'm gonna I'm gonna send in and then we can run that. And this should be enough to then build out a command line tool on top of it. So we can say Python local CLI predicts and Python. Oh, I need to say prints. We'll do print here. There we go. Prints, not Python. Ooh, there we go. We got it. So if so, what, what I could do is I could even say, you know, like, um, you know, def uh, human readable readable. And we could say, uh, you know, value, say if value is equal to, um, is equal to one, return fake news, right? Else. Or, or I don't even do else. I can just say return real news. So, you know, some, something, something like that, right? So what I could do as well is I could also say um, return human readable result. Let's try that. Human readable like this, and and now now we can 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 build this out. Let's go ahead and do this. Add a comma here. 
or a, a colon and fake news. There we go. We got a we got a fake news detector. So now let's build this into command line tool using click. So I would import click next. So import click, and then we just need to steal some of the ideas from my other projects. And so I will um, just really briefly in another screen grab that real quick. Just get, let me get this real quick here. Get this. Yeah, so, so basically we can steal some of these ideas. Uh, I'm gonna just make a like a temp file here, like a, I guess I could just put this in the readme. Just, I'll, I'll put a, I'll, I'll put a little bit of extra code in here just, just so I can like refer to it. So I would wanna do this. I would wanna build out on top of that function, something like this. So let's just maybe even copy this piece of code here. I'm gonna copy all of this and I'm gonna paste this into our local predict. So this thing's working. And so all I need to do is put inside of here like this and um, do uh, another function and we'll say predict CLI that looks good and this will be text just like this a and we don't even need a, a prompt let's just get rid of that and we'll just say like pass in text for real or fake news like this and then we can um, go through here and th leave this function and we'll, we'll, we'll change this to text just like this, and we can say predict uh, news real or fake. And we can go here and change this as well, text. And then uh, I think we don't need to do anything at all, but, but we could say if, um, if, if fake in result, we could we could basically make it like a red or something like that. We could we could say we could do red, and we could do result. And else, we would put the result in and we make it green. So something like this. I th I think this might just work. And then I need to go and, and put the, the if under name thing down here. And we'll put this in. And we're also gonna need to do predict, let's see, is that word? Yeah, I think that this will work. And we'll do predict CLI. Yeah, there we go. This looks like it might work on first try. We'll see if we'll get lucky. So if I go through here and I say, Loc Python local CLI predicts. Uh, what did I do here? Let's see, this should be. It says real real news. If fake and result. Well, let's let's do this. We we may have some bugs in this. Let, let's lint it first. That's what I typically would do is let's add this to the lint. So we have predict fake news, main.py, and we also had um, local CLI um, predicts. Let's do that. So let's go ahead and say make lint, see if we have any problems with our code. We probably do. No, no problems with the code, but I do need to pass in the, the text here. So let's go ahead and say this dash dash text, you know, aliens are coming from outer space. Outer space, there we go. 
And in this case, it accepted the payload. And there we go, we say, we say fake news. So it appears to be working. Now this warning, future warning is annoying and it's messing my command line tool up. So I'll say, let's ignore that warning here. So just give me a second, ignore warnings, Python or pandas. Let's, let's do this. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to put this into our code because for a command line tool, not great to have that warnings there. Let's run it one more time. There we go. So he says accepted payload. Aliens are coming from outer space, um, which which is which is nice. And then it says fake news. So in theory, I mean, you know, I don't know how I would vouch for this this model yet because I've, I, I just clicked some buttons and created it. But in theory, we have something that's kind of useful. Um, and let's go ahead and add all this code in and get commit, adding working uh, fake news CLI. Now, whether it actually works well for real news, that's a great question. Um, I could try to take some New York Times story potentially uh, about Russia or something. Let's 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 see if I can grab a little bit of a text in another window and say, oh, we'll see if I can put this in somewhere. Here we go. Okay, I grab I grab some text, and uh, I'm gonna gr throw this into our chameleon tool. Here, let's let's go ahead and put this. This is like a new, a real headline from New York Times. About two million people remaining in Kiev are galvanized by newfound unity. And uh oh, it thinks it's fake news. So maybe maybe our fake news detector is is not fully ready for prime time. Um, it needs to be flushed out a little bit more. But conceptually, we 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 potentially could could use something similar to this. So really the next step here would be now that I've got this thing working is, is, is we've got prototyping, we've tested two kinds of command line tools. You know, can, can we now containerize it and build a microservice and, and push that into production? That's, that's really the next step. The other thing is that if we go back to Databricks, which I'll bring up now in another window, can, can we actually also see how their endpoint would work? in terms of uh, production. So notice that I had um, inside of Databricks here, we, we, we had uh, this model registered. And in fact, if I go to models here, we see that this uh, text only fake news endpoint is ready. If I go through here and I say, oh, there we go, it's ready. We could even experiment with this text and send the request and it says, one 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 zero one. These are all the different pieces of text, and I was able to just give me fake or, or real news uh, results here. So, so we we could do this as well. In fact, I could even change this. <coughs> I could change this whole interface here, and we could test out a similar thing, right? We could say this uh, text. And we could put in, you know, aliens are coming from outer space. And if I do a request, there we go. Just one comes back because one is fake and zero, zero is true. Uh, so we also can, can call this endpoint, which is another version of this. Now, the, the downside of this approach and why I think the microservice approach external to a platform like Databricks is, is an interesting idea, is that I have to run this really expensive endpoint and it's just sitting here just churning, just burning <laughs> burning money. And it's just, it's not even doing anything most of the time, right? So depending on what kind of problem, this may or may not be exactly you know what you care about. It is pretty straightforward to also externally call it though via an API. If you if you needed to use the the, the Databricks uh, endpoint, so I think the next thing 
that, that, that we can cover is that now that I've got all this stuff working, can I actually take that entire project and actually containerize it and push that into uh, a microservice on the AWS platform? And I think we can. I think we, we can actually uh, do that next. And so what I'll do is um, I'm going to I'm going to tee this thing up. I'm going to I'm going to go to this environment again and I'm going to go back to our original example which what I started with which is the the standalone command line tool and first get that working is is getting the uh, the MLOps cookbook example working where we predicted someone's height and and then I'm going to push that into a microservice and then containerize it. Once I've got that working, then I'll go back to this example, containerize it, and put that into a continuous delivery uh, microservice. So we're, we're, we're in good shape because we have two different models. One was just, we found it somewhere. Basically, we just, we took one. Another one we created using AutoML. And then next up, we'll take both and we'll, and we'll push it into the AWS ecosystem. And the one that I'll show you that, that I'll use, that, that um, I've been using quite a bit lately, is a service called AWS App Runner. I'll put this into our, our tab here. So this is, the, this is the service that I'm gonna show when we come back from break, is this AWS App Runner. And what's really nice about it is that you can add either the source or a container. It'll take that container, it'll give you a fully working uh, encrypted endpoint and then you can actually start playing around with your, your microservice. So it really works very well for delivering uh, models into production. Uh, and and it, it's, a, it's a great service for when you've already got the model, but you don't necessarily want to call the traditional endpoint to, to do the production uh, you know, deploy. So I'm going to share another tab here. And, and so th this is like yet another platform that can do ML ops. And this particular platform has uh, integrated feature store, real-time serving pipeline, built-in monitoring and retraining, and then also CI, CD for ML. And in particular, there's a uh, project here that uh, is this fraud demo project that has a good example of of some of the stuff that you're talking about. So in this particular example here, we can look at everything that's happening. We can see there's events running. Uh, these are the real-time events. We have the workflow running. And then if I look at the model itself, uh, I could actually uh, see in real time, basically what, what what's happening with it and look at a drift analysis and potentially or a feature analysis and see that oh look in this particular example you know this this particular feature is drifting uh, according to the last time that i that i trained it and that i may want to to go through and potentially you know re, re, retrain the model and so this is something that there this particular platform is monitoring on the endpoint itself so i think this is definitely an interesting idea is that you bake in the ability to monitor for drift into the endpoint itself, and then in real time, it actually shows you what's happening. Likewise, another thing we didn't really get into that much, but is this concept of a feature store. And the feature store itself could be another place where you could go through and look at you know, metadata about you know, potentially the last time the data was uh, put into your, your system. And you know what's the what's the latest version of the data versus what's in the feature store and is there some kind of a delta so really i guess between the difference of the feature store uh, and the model in production you, th those are those are the points where you could actually take a look and and, and really see what's what's happening so uh, hopefully then it was able to answer your your question i think the next thing that i'll that i'll cover here would be to keep moving and, and, and again, build out a uh, structure here for 
uh, deploying this into into production and so I'm going to go into this particular uh, platform here which is the uh, AWS Cloud9 platform and I'm going to go back to that original model that I was dealing with and what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, resize this environment first and so I'm going to I'm going to download a script uh, real quick AWS resize um, cloud nine <clears throat> and I typically do this just give me one second to find this script uh, I typically do this uh, when I first start working with containers uh, because it allows me to to, to not have to worry about space issues and I'll just give this uh, I'll get this real quick and throw this script let me just get this script here cloud nine disk resize here we go I got it okay okay so I'm gonna I'm gonna put a I'm gonna build a script inside of here called um, cloud nine resize here so let's let's go ahead and do this we'll close this close this close this and uh, I'm going to CD into Python ML ops cookbook and I'm gonna build a resize .sh script here and what's nice about this is that if I run this it, it will it will make this environment a little bit bigger for me to work with container so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, run this we'll type in bash resize right here and there we go so I just made this thing a little bit bigger original size was 10 and I think it's going to make it like 25 yeah or something like that okay now it's a little bit bigger and I'll even check that in as well commit this adding resize Okay, so so then the next thing that that we can do now that we've got this resize is 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 containerize this this project uh, uh, so that we can we can push it into the AWS Cloud9 ecosystem. So how do we actually do this? How do we actually containerize this? Well, the first thing to be aware of is the that we would need to uh, toggle back and forth between the container registry. And so, uh, in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to throw this into our tab here, and I'm going to go to ECR, which is Elastic Container Registry, and we're going to create a new um, a new container registry uh, location where we store our microservice as well as our model. So the first one that we'll do is we'll create one called uh, MLOps. Uh, cookbook so that would be the the, the one that had the uh, height weight model into it and I'll just go ahead and say create repository once I've done this we're in great shape because all, all I need you to do is go to this MLOps cookbook uh, example here and look at the push commands right here and uh, these push commands here are are pretty straightforward and I can even just copy them all and uh, maybe keep them around for, for when I actually work on them. So I'll just put those into like a, a browser here so that I can use, or, or a text pad on the side here. So what I'm gonna do is, is now that I've got this thing set up, we look at the, the images that I would, or the commands I would need to push it. I, I'm gonna go back to cloud nine and then I'm gonna push things into this repo because the AWS app runner environment, if I go here, it, it can take, it can actually take a container. So, so let's go ahead and go to cloud nine, go back to that environment. <clears throat> okay, open ID and we'll, we'll go here. Okay, great. So we're, we're back in our, our Cloud9 environment, and all I need to do is do those commands to, to get this thing running. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to log in. I'm going to log into uh, the, the, 
the uh, ECR. There we go. AWS ECR login. Great. We got it, we got it working. The next thing that I'm going to do is notice that because I have this Docker file here, we're in great shape. I can actually um, use this to, to build out the, the model. So uh, I would inherit first from Python 3.8.8, and then I would uh, work in this directory and then build out these packages right here and then put those into an endpoint that runs a, a microservice. I can even run the microservice first here. I can just say python app.py. And in this case, I don't know why we're getting that issue. I could Google that real quick. I think it's some silly issue that I've seen before. Oh, you cannot import, you need to update Flask to two version two okay well let's update flask then okay so i'm going to go to requirements and i'm going to update flask well what i'll do is i'll just do this i'll take out the flask version and i'll do make install to find the latest version this is one way if you have uh, package conflicts and then if i run it let's see if it works nope it doesn't that doesn't seem to work um it says, yeah, that's actually a very strange message that I'm that I'm getting here, that I've that I've never seen before. Um, let's let's try one more time here to see really quick if I can fix it within a second. And. It seems to be related to the latest version. In my case, oh, I I see. You can you can do. Hmm. Let me see if I can make one more change here. Let's let's see if I can I can fix this. Make install. And okay, that that fixed it. <laughs> so it it just needed a, a particular version. And if I could I could even pick, fix the Flask version too because I could type in pip freeze and then um, grep uh, flask. There we go. So we'll, we'll use this version of flask. We'll just put this one in, the one, one, two. There we go. Got it, got it all working. We know that the, the microservice works. So let's go ahead and, and build the container. I'm glad I tested that first. And we can go through here and we can say Docker build MLOps cookbook. There we go. We got this thing running, and again, because I have a fast environment here, we were able to to push things pretty quick. Okay, this is looking good. The next thing that I will do is I will I will actually tag this image once this thing's done. That looks good. And then I'll I'll tag it and then I'll push it. And once I push this, we have a lot of of new opportunities available to us. And the reason is that uh, I can now use many different parts of AWS to serve this thing out and make it a, a continuous delivery process, in fact, without needing to do anything else. That, that's the nice thing about containers is as long as you push the new container to the container registry, then that's all you need to do. So if we go to the AWS console, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just uh, to paste this into this window so we we can keep the, the same screen. So in, inside of App Runner, all I need to do is say create an App Runner service and I just point it to that container registry, the one we just created. In this case, I'll, the provider will be Amazon ECR. I would click on the image repository and look, there we go, MLOps cookbook. And let's go ahead and run this. And now this is what's pretty, pretty cool about this is I can again set up continuous delivery. 
And this is AppRunner will monitor your registry and deploy a new version every time you push a new image of it. So you could have the build system like, for example, um, GitHub Actions can do this. It could be pushing new versions like it, you could query the model registry, for example, ask if there's a new version. We just saw how to do that. You could download a model, take it, containerize it. Once you push the container, the deployment already works. And so now we would say, what kind of access rule? Let's go ahead and pick this one. Let's pick this access rule. And we could say, you know, continuous delivery of um, MLOps cookbook. And I don't really need to do anything else. Everything else is good default. And we can go through here and we can say push. And this will take just a few minutes and it will it will deploy this microservice. And what's awesome about this as well is that look what it gives us. It gives us an encrypted endpoint, which, which works pretty well. It also gives us uh, a link to the repository. And let's actually open that up. And just so you can see it while this thing's running, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, show the repository. Look, this is the image I just pushed. You can see the size, actually pretty small size because I used a slim package. Uh, and uh, it shows me everything I need to know about that uh, particular image. So pr pretty nice process once you've got this set up is that it will go to this uh, uh, endpoint here and you can see that in fact, I can watch everything happen in real time. And, and even if I needed to, I could build out a custom domain for this, like my company or api.mycompany.com or, or whatever I needed to build. But this is a basically production quality uh, service that would be serving out this, this ML uh, endpoint. Well, what we could do, because this will take a few minutes to create, is we could also go to our other projects and let's try to deploy a second. Um, let's try to deploy a second machine learning service. That way, we can deploy two, right? Because this is the the one earlier. That's pretty simple. Let's see if we can deploy a slightly more complex version. So let me find that environment. Here we go. And uh, I'm going to paste this into our window. And uh, what what we would need to do is we would essentially need to just slightly tweak things a little bit here in that um, I'm going to maybe open up a new window, a new terminal here. I'm going to deactivate this virtual environment because I want to use a slightly different one for a different project. And I'll create a new virtual environment. And we'll, and we'll do this. We'll say Python 3 virtual environment. And we'll call this one um, maybe Databricks. <clears throat> there we go. And then I could source it. And then I could actually check out that other repo. So let me grab that another window. And we'll go for MLflow project best practices. <clears throat> and we'll get clone this thing. There we go. We got it. And uh, I can CD into there. And we could do a make all. And if you remember, this is the one that had the model. We, we just updated it to a, a slightly simpler text based model that did uh, fake news detection. Give this just a second. Pilot home. Perfect. Great. We got it. We got it all working. Things are are running in a great great way here. 
And then notice as well, we have a Docker file. So this one's gonna be a little bit different. I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly different, but just to, to give you some comparison here, what I'm doing in this particular Docker file is I'm using the Lambda base image, which is, which is kind of an interesting base image here in that uh, it potentially could be used to, to be pushed to AWS Lambda if I needed to. But what I do here is uh, I uh, imp make a directory called app, I copy this uh, fast API microservice to app directory, I copy the model inside, I copy the requirements, and then I do an installation, and then I will uh, serve out this particular uh, project. So uh, in order to do this one, we're also gonna need to create another uh, tagged image and build it and all that other stuff. So what I'll need to do is go to ECR again, uh, and behind the scenes, I'll, I'm gonna create another repo, and, and this one I'll call, I'm gonna create it uh, in, in fast API. Uh, I'll just do this in another window so I don't, I don't have to go back and forth here. And I'm gonna create this and then I'll, I'll essentially fast API ML ops. I'll do this, yeah, fast API ML ops, I've got this thing. And then I'm gonna copy the push commands and then I'll, I'll bring them back to here in a second. Here we go. Okay, so in our window here, all I need to do is build, we've already authenticated, and I'm in the repo that has the container, so I just run in docker build, the, the name of the image. So let's go ahead and do that. This one will be a little bit bigger because I'm using Amazon's uh, Lambda, Lambda repo, which will take a little bit of time because it's gonna get, there's more stuff inside of it. And let's let all this stuff go through. And one thing I'll point out though, is that before you even push it to the container registry, we could actually test the Docker container local to just make sure everything works. It's possible it won't work. I mean, this is kind of a new workflow I just created today. So I always assume the first time I do something, there would be problems with it. Uh, but but let's let's go ahead and see what happens. Okay, so if I type in the Docker image ls, the, this shows me all of the containers that are on my system. And look, this is the one I just built. So in theory, this image ID, I could run it. And I think I might have some instructions in the readme file about how to run it. And in fact, Um, I don't, well, it, it, it's, it's fairly straightforward. I can, I can basically just, um, do, do the Docker command here. Let me just get it real quick. And flask, 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 microservice and Docker command here. Let me just grab this thing. Flask. No, oh, I, want, I want fast API. Sorry, fast API. Fast API. I have a Docker command for it, and here we go. Got it right here in front of me. Okay, so it's we're gonna run now this this command, which is Docker run, 
and then I just need to put in the ID of that I found up here, which would be which would be this image ID right here. There we go. So I'm going to paste it in here, and in theory, it should work unless we have problems. So far, it's working, and then I could I could basically make a prediction against this endpoint. So even before I push it to the app runner service, I could also just test this out. So uh, let me open up a new terminal and I'm going to CD into this environment here and I could just curl this endpoint, which that will probably not be what I want because it's running on local host. Let's double check my command here. Zero, zero, 127, 80, 80. Hmm. I think we could try localhost to see if that works. Not, not, but what we could do actually is this. Instead of running that command like that, I could just say run it on 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Let's try that. What, does that work? I think it does. And now if I curl this, this might work. Yeah, hmm. for some reason I'm, I'm having some kind of a, a curl issue with this thing, but let's just assume it's gonna work. Let, let's, without me di digging into why my my Docker command doesn't work. So how would I push this thing? Well, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna tag it and uh, push this into here. And then I'll do a Docker push command right here. There we go. So so we're, we're now pushing this into the same container registry. So we have two different kinds of machine learning models. One was the one we created in our cloud-based Spark system. The other one is the one I already had. Uh, and we can see they should behave very, very similar uh, in terms of, of, of how they operate, except for one is a very different kind of service because we trained this model from an external big data system. And notice this is a big, big model too. Now the model, I'm sorry, uh, Docker container. Now it's not because of the model, the model's tiny. It's just that this particular base image was from AWS Lambda and they, for some reason, made it really, really big. So it's just something to be aware of. And once this gets to 1.2, we should be good to go. And there we go. So, so now I'm gonna go back to our, um, I'm gonna go back to our Cloud9 ecosystem. So I'm gonna pull this up in another window and then show you. So we've got Cloud9, or I'm sorry, um, App Runner. Let's go to App Runner. And this is looking maybe good. So we have, we have this one, which is the one I just created. Let's go ahead and uh, there we go. Predict weight from Major League Baseball players. This is the URL. I'm gonna go ahead and type it in here. Here we go. And then if I want to put uh, the endpoint here, which is predicts, uh, you could see that I could go through here and, and invoke this. Now I have a, I have a command line tool that I that I wrote that'll help us actually call this endpoint so that I don't have to do anything fancy. So so what I can do is I can go back to my um, I can go back to my other environment and invoke this service right because so we know right because we we know it's working, but if if I want to do a post command and all that stuff. I can't do it from the browser. I need to do it from some other location. So what we can do is um, to, to run this particular command is I can just go back. I can basically go back to my Cloud9 environment and just invoke it real quick. So let's, let's swap windows here, go back to Cloud9, and we'll, we'll go back to our other terminal, 
right, which is right here, the MLOps cookbook. And remember, I had this utility, which was utils CLI. So here's where it comes in handy. If I do, do the help, one of the things that we can do is it says predict, sends a prediction to the endpoint. So let's see what, what that does. Uh, we can do this prediction, whoops, prediction. Um, help. No such command. What is it? Oh, predict. Yeah, predict. That's right. Predict help. Okay, let's run this thing. Aha, it says host. And so I even could look at the code real quick to just double check what the. Um, what the what the mlops cookbook utils command tells me to do i could have made that a little bit more document self-documented but i think the url just needs to be oh i see the full url with the with the predict endpoint as well so i'll do predict uh, dash dash host and then i'll put in that url for app runner and then I'll do predicts, and then it'll, it should do a prediction. There we go. So now this is querying that endpoint that we that we pushed via uh, AWS App Runner. And then if I wanted to put in more weight or, or, or change the value, I would just go through here and just say, you know, 155, for example, right? And then it goes through and it, it shows us uh, a different a, a different value. So pretty pretty neat here that we were able to 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 get that thing get that thing working. In fact, if I go back there now to to the to the app runner service, which I can just pull up real quick and uh, throw this into our our window, we should see those invocations now. So if we go through here, we see the service is running. We have the activity, the metrics. And under the metrics, we should see, look, there we go. We've been invoking it, right? I just invoked it four times. And in fact, I and I can see that these are all successful invocations. And uh, latency, active instances, all that stuff is pretty, pretty neat. If I want to go to logs, I also could say view in CloudWatch and also get all the logging input as well. So whatever I decided to put inside of there would, would show up uh, in, inside of this ecosystem as well. You can see that this thing's um, running, uh, I'm sorry, in, in, in this log events here. And uh, also if I wanted to click on application logs, if I clicked on view in CloudWatch, I'll have to throw that to you real quick into another window. We'll do this. We can see the application logs and, and whatever our service is doing in terms of application will, will pop up here as well. And we can see all the different things that we're doing. Here's the, uh, basically the, the, um, the post request right here. There we go. We can see the, the prediction right here, right? All this, all this stuff that verifies that I just, I just called that, uh, that service. So very, very nice. And again, all I need to do is programmatically push the new version of the, the container in order to get this thing running into production. So we've verified that this thing works. Now let's go to the other AWS App Runner service and I'm going to open that up and, and, and build out a new one. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's go to our, change our window here to go to AWS App Runner and let's create a second service. And this will be the, the Databricks model that we created earlier and I'm gonna use ECR right here. So we'll go browse. And I remember the name of that was called Fast API ML Ops. Let's go ahead and see if we can find it. There we go, Fast API ML Ops. We'll go ahead and say continue. And then we'll do the same thing. We'll do continuous delivery, right? Because we wanna keep pushing new versions of this container. We'll use an existing service. And we'll say push container production uh, or no we'll, we'll just call this uh, fast API ML ops there we go 
that looks good. And this will take just a second to, to deploy uh, as well. Uh, and, and, then, and then we can test it out. So maybe this is a good spot to, while this is for the next five minutes deploying, we, we can talk a little bit about the architecture that, that, we actually, that we actually built. And I can sketch this out. That would probably be a good thing to do. So I'm going to pull up Sketchpad here. And let's do that. Let's go to Sketch. And let's try this out. And let's build this. So let me just get this going. And uh, I'm make this a flat screen here. So in a nutshell, let's also get a little bit thicker of a pin, maybe like that. That looks good. You know, you you have you have a couple different flavors here that we we're able to show. The first one was we had the Databricks system, which would be the platform. Now it could be any platform; it doesn't have to be Databricks, but and we could even put platform here. And so the, the, the platform does a lot of th nice things for us in that it, it has this feedback loop of, you know, it has the model, it has the, the data, it has the, um, you, know, you know, notebooks, all that kind of really cool stuff uh, in, inside of here uh, available for us. Um, and then as a result of that, we just we downloaded that that model, and then we we put we package it up and push that into ECR, which is the Amazon Container Registry. Once it's in the Container Registry, then we build out a microservice via the App Runner. It could go to I mean it doesn't have to go to App Runner. It could go to lots of different services on AWS. This one in particular happens to push this out to to app runner right like it's it's a base it's basically a a um, a great ecosystem to to push out a endpoint and then if we want to curl it we just curl this endpoint and we say you know HTTP blah right and this and this goes through and, and lets us have uh, the, the the end result. The, the second way, this would be, you know, method one. The second way is you could just get a model somewhere. It could You could even download the model from somewhere and then do the same thing, right? You could just download the model, push it into a container registry, and then and then do a de deployment. And it, and it is a fairly legitimate point to be able to, to just download a model. In fact, th let me show you what I mean by that is that if we go to uh, something called TF Hub, this would be a great example. This TensorFlow Hub, you can just download a model right here. And it's got all kinds of things like text problems, image problems, video problems, audio problems. Let's just take one of these things like image classification. I could just take one of these and look right here. It, just, it tells you right here, you just go through here, TFI version one. You 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 literally download this, package it up, and, and serve it serve it as as some kind of a, a a model here, and and this is a great technique I think, in order to to take other people's work and and use it. Uh, you also can pick the different formats as well, like TF Lite. So you could take a, a very small uh, model like this, and 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 you can actually. Go through, download it. It gives you the whole the whole version of of, of how to actually input things in, into it, and then and then serve that out uh, via a containerization. So so you don't always have to to produce the model yourself. In, in our case, on one I did train it locally, and a second one I trained it with AutoML. But you also could just download it from some other location. I think we're seeing more and more of these kind of hub based solutions. 
uh, becoming available as well. But that's basically you know all, all we did. So now that that we've kind of gone, gone through the theory there, let's go back to the app runner service and let's take a look at uh, the final phases here. Hopefully this thing is pretty easy to to get running. We can see it's performing a health check. There we go. It looks pretty good. And once this health check is over, it should be routing traffic to the to the endpoint. And if everything goes as planned, fingers crossed, we can use the Swagger API doc to to make uh, calls to this fake news uh, ML service and actually use it as a as a prototype. <clears throat> Okay, let's go ahead and uh, flush this thing out here. Perfect. Service is set to running. Great. Looking good. It looks like it's probably running. I could copy this. Uh, there we go. So it's all running. So I can just copy this and I'll just paste this into our into our screen here. And check this out. Okay, so at least at least something's running, right? Which is good. Now, what if I go through here and I say um, docs, right, like this. Aha, we, we have this thing working, potentially. We do a post, try it out, and we can do the same thing we did before, which is uh, aliens are coming. Let's just make it even quicker. <laughs> aliens are coming. And then go ahead and execute this, and we can see, yep, fake news. There we go. So. I think this is a reasonably compelling workflow that would work with many different kinds of models. You can see here, this thing is actually working. And in fact, if you want to try it out yourself, you're welcome to, right? While this thing's running, no promises, I'll leave this running for, for too long, but, but you can try it out yourself uh, and make your own fake news predictions. But this, this I think is a, is a fairly compelling workflow here because of the fact that it doesn't matter where we got the the endpoint. So that's probably worth talking about a little bit more as well, is just to, to sketch out that, that idea a little bit more. So if we just make this a little simpler as well, if I go back here, let's go to this, that if we, if we look at a model there, there's in a sense almost like four ways to 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 four or five different ways to to serve out a model. Let's assume that you're using some kind of uh, microservice framework, and we'll, we'll just call this the microservice microservice. Right, and and where where did this actually come from? Well, we well it came from uh, a container registry, and and we could actually just maybe call that out, and we'll just say this is a container registry. Like that. So, so really, it's not too bad, right? We have a microservice container registry, and then here's the part that is kind of open: is that you you could have a version where you um, download it, right? So that that's option one: is you just download. Right, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll call this models. So it's almost like who cares where you got it? Download it, you put it into the, and, and we, can, we can basically do this. We can make like a, a models and put like a, it can go here, right? The models can go, that's option one. Two is AutoML. And AutoML is pretty compelling especially if you can just package that thing up and and, and push it into a, a containerized microservice 
The third option is you do it the traditional way, where is you build it yourself. You build from scratch. That's that's a that's a third way. Um, I guess a fourth way that you could also, you know, do do it yourself potentially is you could also call an endpoint, right? So maybe the model lives in a, in a third party ecosystem. So those are those are four ways that I think are interesting to consider. You know, either download the model from some other location maybe even tweak it a little bit by using transfer learning to use AutoML via some system like Databricks, SageMaker, Azure ML Studio, you know, whatever, whatever system you want. And then third, you could just build it yourself from scratch. I think many people have obviously been doing this one, right? This is the one that people have been doing for a long time. I would just argue for an MLOps kind of workflow you may not always want to do that because in some situations you don't need to, right? It's it's a little bit like, do you always need to build, you know, a meal from scratch? Depending on what you have on your schedule, it may take a little bit of time to to, to do that. So you, you do want to be a little bit careful when, when you're actually, you know, teeing that up. And then finally, for an endpoint, uh, you also don't necessarily need to even do any of these. You could just call an endpoint like what we covered in the case of the data, the, the Databricks endpoint. Uh, and the part that comes into the, the operational component is when you get into things like container registry, microservice, you see it's trivial. Every time I make a change to my project or a change to the model, I just trigger a new build. It pushes that new container into the container registry, which then deploys the microservice. So, I think this is a reasonable way to to think about models when you're building uh, MLOps systems. And maybe maybe the last thing that I will that I will bring up here uh, in in talking about this is that we can take a look uh, again at that Databricks ecosystem and just look at a few other things that I didn't get a chance to cover potentially. <clears throat> so in it, obviously we can, we can actually go to the, uh, the model here and, and look at the, the, the ones that are running in production. And you can see here that the, the, main, the main advantage of something like this is it is kind of nice that I can just go through here and say, send request, right? And it goes through and it gives me, I can test out my system. I think that's one of the nice ones. Now I could invoke it though. I could just copy this and give this to somebody else on my team and then you could build a library around it. And, and that's definitely a reasonable solution. Here's a different one I had, I had created a while back, uh, which is um, I did AutoML for NBA positions to try to predict what position an NBA player would be. And watch, I can do the same thing. I could say show example. And we see here that I take in the uh, the rank, the player's name, their age, how many minutes they play a game, field goals, field goal percent attempts, field goal percentage, so a bunch of different features here, assists, steals, blocks. And what it does is it is it will give me a prediction of what uh, position they might most likely would, would play. Uh, power forward, power forward, shooting guard, shooting forward, and... Uh, uh, point guard, right? So I've, I've, I'm able to get this and play around with it. So, so this is definitely for prototyping. Before I, maybe I don't want to do this long term, but I did find this to be a, a reasonably useful uh, feature uh, for for this uh, Databricks platform. The other thing to consider as well um, would be that you also can use things like jobs platforms as well. Uh, when you're when you're dealing with things so you could potentially retrain your model automatically by just creating a job and pointing it to a notebook and that's another way of doing uh, auto ml or new versions of the model is because the data beneath the scenes is constantly changing all you need to do here is add a new name for your job say you know retrain model for example and then you would just say uh, what kind of job you want to run. It could even be a Python script or it could be a notebook, depending on what it, whatever it is you're trying to do. And, and then I would select my notebook, which which could be live in a repository even. 
It could even go into one of these the, these repository notebooks, and then it, it, it would go through and and run that job periodically. So there are, there are some really neat features that are that are available here. Uh, the other thing that I'll mention that we didn't sh um, cover in experiments uh, would be that if we click on one of these experiments here, you can also do a comparison. So if, if I go like this and I select all the different ones that it went through, all the different uh, experiments, I can actually do a compare. And what it'll do is show me a visualization of basically every single run and it will it will show me you know how like essentially how it actually performed i can also look at a scatter plot based on potentially what kinds of models uh, it was able to to run and i also could visually look at the the comparison as well of the different things so like for example you know if i want to look through here and look at the different test accuracies I could also visualize it here. So this is definitely an enhancement, in my opinion, uh, over like just traditional machine learning because your team can now go through and they can look at all the different experiments that, that were run and you you can work along with other people and, and re really kind of compare things back and forth. And so I think this is the collaborative nature of things as well, is that everybody can work inside of a team and, and look at you know what you're doing inside of your project and not just look at the code that you have in your individual notebook